Here we go. Here we go. As we come to chapter 7 tonight, it is a what we call a parenthetical chapter in the book of Revelation. Beginning with chapter 6 and going all the way to the end of chapter 19 is a seven-year period in the future. Seven years. But as we look at chapter 7 tonight, as I say, it's called a parenthetical chapter because the timeline for that seven-year period is still advancing. But God now gives us a view of what's happening, first of all, in a particular area upon the earth and then a particular uh, scene in heaven. So we'll be looking at two aspects of something that's going on during that seven-year timeline that's still continuing to advance. So as we begin chapter seven tonight, this being uh, a very important part of our study, and I think it'll be a great encouragement, hopefully a great encouragement to you. And so as we go into this book, I just trust that as we follow along, the, looking at the outline and so forth like that, it'll give you that proper perspective of what is happening and what is taking place. And you'll have an understand of what God has planned for the future. So we will turn to chapter seven. And what do we find here in chapter seven? Well, we find Jesus. Back in chapter six, we saw Jesus opening up the seals on the seven sealed scroll. And each one of those seals that we looked at in chapter six initiated a judgment upon the earth. And so tonight we continue with that scroll and we start out with verse one of chapter seven with these words. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, upon the sea, or upon any tree. So here we have the scene of these angels. And uh, as we get further into chapter eight, we'll see these seven angels with seven trumpets. But for now, we'll see these four angels. Now, when we covered the introduction of this book, we looked at a, a number of numbers, so to speak, and that, what they represented. And as we looked at the number four, that is a worldly number because we have four that represents the four seasons of the year. We have four that represents, you know, various directions, north, south, east, and west, and so forth like that. And so here we have these four angels, and they are restraining the wind. And so before these trumpets begin to sound, why these angels are causing somewhat of a delay and allowing us to get a picture because when we get in chapter eight, some horrible judgments will begin to take place. But before those judgments take place, we see these four angels who are standing, where? at the four corners of the earth and they're holding off the judgments because they're so terrible that God wants this incredible time to kind of stall and wait before those judgments take place. But we're going to be seeing some things taking place here in chapter seven that are somewhat apart from the terrible judgments which we'll see in chapter eight. So as we begin in chapter seven, we'll read about the tribulation believers. Now, during the tribulation period, which will be the most horrible time that will face this earth and the people upon it, there will be a huge number of people who will get saved. But before that happens, we find here in this chapter that God seals a particular number of servants because we saw here, we see here in chapter seven, verse uh, two, and I saw another angel extending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. So now we have not only the four angels who are holding back the wind, so to speak, but now we have another angel here and they're going to do a special ministry of sealing the servants of God. So 
What are the purpose of these four angels? Well, first of all, they're going to carry out the will and the judgments of God. Also, we'll see as we get into chapter 8, they will bring destruction and devastation upon the earth. And, however, before that destruction takes place, those judgments are being restrained by these angels as they obey the will of God. And they're going to continue to restrain and keep those judgments from being poured out until there's a particular select group of witnesses that will be sealed for a special ministry that will take place that we'll see here beginning in verse 4 of this chapter. But let's just read here. In verse 3 we read, we're told, Do not harm the earth, the sea, the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Now, as you go through scripture, you find many instances where God seals certain individuals. And that seal is somewhat of a seal of approval, but also a seal of protection. When you and I got saved, we're told in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, that we were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. And that sealing denotes the fact that we're now under new ownership. We belong to the Lord. And how sure is that seal? It's very sure. Because when you read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, that we're told, grieve not the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed until the day of redemption. When is the day of redemption? That day when God takes us home. Now, in a sense, we were redeemed the moment we gave our lives to Jesus based upon his shed blood upon the cross. And so, figuratively, we were redeemed. But physically, our bodies are still waiting for that day of redemption, in which case it will be redeemed and we'll be given new bodies. And we're told that we are sealed up until that day. Now, as we go through this chapter, we'll find 144,000 individuals who will be sealed. And as we go through this timeline of Bible prophecy in the book of Revelation, where these witnesses go out and represent the Lord and give out the gospel, when their ministry is complete, and we'll see this later on, all 144,000 of these individuals will still be there. Not one will be lost. Which says to me that God's seal is secure and true. So these people are going to be sealed. But this scene that we're looking at here is taking place upon the earth. There in verse 4, John writes, And I heard the number of those who were sealed. What was the number? 144,000. And who are these individuals? They come from all the tribes of the children of Israel who were sealed. So we see now these people who are being sealed. It should be kind of an interesting scene, don't you think? Seeing these angels sealing 144,000. I wonder how long that would take. Is it done individually, you know, or is it boom, they're all sealed? I don't know. But 144,000, that is a huge number, is it not? And so they are sealed. So we're told now in these verses that they're not just anyone who are sealed. In fact, we're told that they come from the children of Israel. And beginning in verse 5, all the way down through verse 8, we're told that there's 12,000 that comes from 12 tribes. 12,000 that come from 12 tribes. And we're told, according to verse 3, that they become the servants of God. And the seal is placed upon their foreheads. Placed upon their foreheads. And we're told that they come from all the tribes of the children of Israel, 12,000 from each tribe. And as we examine these tribes, we will understand that uh, not all the tribes that we typically think of, as far as the children of Israel is concerned, are listed here. There's a couple of tribes that are missing. For instance, the tribe of Dan, and the tribe of Ephraim is missing. And so we ask the question, why, why is that? Well, throughout scripture, there's 29 separate instances where the tribes of Israel are listed. And sometimes not all the tribes 
that we typically think of are listed. In this particular situation, as I mentioned, Ephraim and Dan are absent. Why would that be? We don't know why for sure, but we can speculate. When Israel was divided and you had the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom, you recall that Jeroboam who headed up the northern kingdom, he erected two golden calves for the people to worship so that they would not be drawn to Jerusalem to worship. And where did he put those calves? He put one in Bethel, which is in Dan, third, the northern part of that northern kingdom. He put the other one in Ephraim, which was a very big tribe, uh, people-wise. And so it could be that because of the idolatry that was associated with those calves, that these tribes are not mentioned by name, but other tribes are thrown in and replaced by them. And so what are the ones that are replaced by them? Well, we're told here that in verse 7, that one of the tribes is Levi. Now, Levi was never allowed to own or possess land. The other tribes were to give them land to occupy, but they had no ownership over that land because God says, I will be your inheritance. And you recall Moses, he was from the tribe of Levi, and it was out of Levi that all the priests came, as well as the servants of the temple and the tabernacle, the, the, the servants of Levi. And so Levi is mentioned here. The other tribe that is not typically or commonly mentioned is found in verse 8, where we have the mention of Joseph. Now Joseph, he was the father of both Manasseh and Ephraim. And so since Ephraim was not mentioned, Joseph was transferred in. Again, it's only speculation as to why this was happening. We don't know for sure. God certainly does. He hasn't told us, he hasn't seen fit to, to tell us that. But what he wanted to know, he wanted us to know that there were 12,000 from these 12 tribes that were chosen and called out and sealed. Now, you kind of wonder, how is it that the Jews, who throughout all of this time, and even to this day, still reject Jesus as their Messiah? How could this be? How could suddenly 144,000 Jews who have still rejected Messiah, Jesus, suddenly come to faith? Some interesting things are taking place, and I've heard this report from several times, that there's some rabbis in Israel that are kind of softening their position concerning their thought about Jesus. Some are going so far as saying, maybe we should take another look at this Jesus and maybe consider that maybe he is the Messiah after all. It could be. Maybe the Lord is kind of warming these individuals up to the point where they're ready to believe. But once the tribulation period starts, they will become believers. To me, this is so amazing. You probably are like me, have been praying for people to get saved. I have for a long time. But this tells me that God can bring a person to that place of salvation you, by using all kinds of circumstances as he no doubt will do here. And so even though these two tribes are missing, God still has plenty to work with as he will bring now these 12,000 from these 12 tribes to faith. So again, those tribes, Dan and Ephraim, are missing. So kind of picture the scene, what that's going to be like. In Israel, can you imagine the tremendous change that would take place as suddenly 144,000 Jewish believers come to faith. By the way, <laughs> these 144,000, they are the true JWs, Jewish witnesses, right? When those folks you know who come to your door and they say that they're a JW, I'll ask them, what tribe are you from? They have no answer. But here are the true JWs, right? So God now lays out this tremendous evangelistic movement 
where these 144,000 will go out and bravely and faithfully witness for him giving out the gospel. So that's what we see here in the first portion of chapter 7. Then as we move into chapter 7, verse 9, we have these words, after these things. Now that phrase is very significant because it gives us some sense of chronology of events, does it not? John says, after these things, I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and with <clears throat> palm branches in their hands. So here we have these saved saints. Now, where are they? They're not on the earth. They're in heaven. Because we're told here in verse 9 where they have come from. They have come out of the great tribulation, have they not? A great multitude which no one can number worldwide from every nation and so forth like that. And we'll see in just a minute where they came from and why they're here. So we notice the people, first of all, who are described. What do we see here in these verses in verse 9? Well, we're told here that it's a number that's beyond numbering. We can't begin to fathom the numbers of these individuals. It seems that during this tribulation period, as dark and as horrible as that time is, that perhaps it'll end up being the greatest evangelistic effort of all history because there will be huge numbers that will get saved. Now, we know there's a lot of people groups throughout the world who have yet to hear the gospel. And God will make sure that everyone has that opportunity to hear the truth about Jesus. And it could be that these people come to faith as a result of perhaps hearing the gospel for the very first time. And how do they hear that? Well, we've already looked at the fact that God's going to send out this huge evangelistic force of 144,000 whose responsibility is to proclaim the gospel, right? So here's a number that gets saved, a number that's so great that it cannot be numbered. And they come from the entire world, all nations, tongues, tribes, people, everywhere else. There are so many people groups, as I said, who have never heard the gospel. Uh, years ago, I, well, I've had the privilege through the years to be able to go in such remote locations where people in times past never heard the gospel by anybody. But because God raised up one missionary, one servant, who went and proclaimed the gospel and people got saved. And apart from God sending that one individual, who knows how long it would have been before they'd gotten saved. And there's a lot of situations like that. So it could be that this huge multitude gets saved as a result of the witness of this 144,000. So we have the description of these people, a huge number, a tremendous size. As we go back into the Old Testament, we see a prophecy in Joel, that little prophet there in the, in the minor prophetical books of the Old Testament, where we're told this, and it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit, notice, on all flesh, every nation, tongue, tribe. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams. This is what Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost. Your young men shall see visions, and also my main servants, my main servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. Not that particular day when Joel gave the prophecy, but in those days, days that would be still future. And I will show wonders in the heaven and in the earth. And certainly, in the time of the tribulation, it will truly be wonders in heaven and upon the earth. In fact, he goes on to describe that. Blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Now, that did not happen on the day of Pentecost. So this is still future. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood. And we'll see more of that as we get into chapter 8. Before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance as the Lord has said among the remnant whom the Lord calls. So there's coming still a day when a huge number 
will turn to the Lord, and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. All we have to do is just turn to the Lord. I heard something the other day. You know, we're, in a sense, we're losing a lot of freedoms, right, in this day and age. But I heard this person say, there's one freedom that we will never lose, and that freedom is to turn to Jesus, to accept him as our Lord and our Savior. That freedom will always be there. God will make sure that everyone has that freedom and they'll have that chance. So, we have the size of the troop, huge numbers, we see the salvation of this multitude. They got saved. Now we look at the situation that's found here. We're going back to chapter 7, verse 9, where we're told they're from everywhere and they're clothed with white robes. They have palm branches in their hands. And what are they doing? Well, we'll see more of that in just a minute. Here we see the statement that comes out of their mouths. They say, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So we have this great worship service, tremendous worship service, and they're praising the Lord. Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Remember what Peter said there in Acts chapter 4? He said, neither is there, there's, there's, there's not salvation Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And how true that is. Only through Jesus can you be saved. Any other approach to salvation is a false gospel. It's only through Jesus and his shed blood that salvation is possible. And these individuals were given the gospel and they came to believe and they were saved. So we see now the scene in heaven where they're having this amazing worship service. Notice here in verse 11 and 12. And the angels stood around the throne and the elders and the four living creatures. What did they do? They fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God. And so there's this crescendo that begins to build up in heaven that then prompts even the angels and the elders to follow through and do the same thing. So there's this tremendous praise that takes place up there in heaven. And they're all standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Now, we know, as we will see later on, that these individuals being in heaven are all martyred during the tribulation period. And it kind of is reflecting back that we saw in the previous chapter, chapter 6, verse 11, about those particular individuals who were martyred. And they cry out to the Lord, Oh Lord, how long until you, re until you um, uh, avenge us of, of our blood, of those who shed our blood upon the earth? Uh, verse 11 of chapter 6. And so these individuals are in heaven, and they're very much like those we saw in chapter 6, because we're told that they were clothed. They washed their robes and they were made white in the blood of the Lamb. Today I kind of did a research on the word white. It occurs several times throughout the book of Revelation. And we know for you and I, all of our righteous were like filthy rags, right? But because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we were all washed and made white. And so white is very significant. And we see the apparel that these individuals have. Their robes were washed and they were made white. Interesting detergent here, the blood of the Lamb. So we see the praise that takes place in heaven. Now we've got a problem. John is seeing all this. He hears them singing this praise to the Lord, and he hears them saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and forever. Amen. And so no doubt he's being moved and caught up in that moment. But then something happens. We're told that one of the elders answered after this crescendo of praise. And he said to John, he asked the question, who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? Who are these individuals? Well, John says, <laughs> he says, 
uh, sir, verses 14, sir, you, you, the ones, sir, you know, so he said to me, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. So here this elder comes forth and he asked John this question, who are these folks? And John can't come up with an answer. He's, he's dumbfounded. Where did he speak? And, and I'm sure that he is just completely blown away because the enormous magnitude, huge numbers of people. And he really can't come up with an answer. And he says, these are the ones who have come out of the great tribulation. Now, most people look at that seven year period, which is called the tribulation, among other things, and they kind of divide it in half. The first half is somewhat a time of peace with the Antichrist who comes with his fake peace and so forth. Israel's happy with him and so forth and so on. But halfway through, according to the book of Daniel, everything changes. And we start what is called the Great Tribulation, where all kinds of horrible things begin to, to take place. And we're told that these individuals come out of the Great Tribulation. So it seems that perhaps what John is seeing here is not towards the beginning of that period of seven years, but more towards the end of that period. Because he describes the fact, he's told they came out of the Great Tribulation. Again, he was told that they washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That's an important comment that John was given. Because only those in heaven will be found wearing with similar clothing, right? That was one of the promises that Jesus gave to the church. And so we've got to have those kinds of clothes. You remember that, that, that parable that Jesus told back in the uh, Gospel of Matthew, where there was this wedding, you know, and so people were invited and so forth. And as the host of the wedding went through and looked at the various people, there was one individual that didn't have the proper dress. And because he didn't have the proper dress, he kind of snuck in and so forth like that. And he was a faker. And so he was thrown out because he didn't have the proper clothes. And so in order to be in heaven, you've got to have the proper clothing. Because we were born with what? All of our righteousness was filthy rags, right? And so these individuals have the right clothing. But now we see the promises of God to this multitude. Notice in verse 15, therefore they are before the throne of God, they serve him day and night in his temple. Once we get to heaven, we won't have these physical bodies that wear out and get tired and need sleep. And I suspect that when we have these new bodies, <laughs> we won't need sleep, don't need naps. We'd mentioned earlier, you know, that we would have the opportunity to eat if we so desire or not because we need it but we will have that freedom to be able to do that but there's no sense uh, there's nowhere mentioned that we will need sleep or rest to recover and so these here they don't rest day nor night but not only that we see not only the promises that god gives them but he gives them promises of complete provision verse 16 says they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The fact that we have those words anymore, and it's mentioned twice here, tells us that their past life, they did get hungry. They did get thirsty. And I can understand that. We get hungry. We get thirsty. But once they're in heaven, that earthly experience is gone forever. But we also see God gives them complete protection. Going back to verse 16, the sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So. Finally, we're told of God's promises of eternal peace. The lamb will shepherd them. He'll take care of them. There'll be no more crying, no more sadness. Every tear will be wiped from their eyes. Imagine that, not ever having a bad day again. How glorious is that gonna be? Well, here we're getting a preview 
of a future scene in heaven and also a picture of what life will be like there. As I was studying through this today, I was reminded that we're not looking at a fairy tale here. We're looking at a real event that will indeed take place. And we need to ask ourselves, uh, what will we, will we be on that future day? We want to make sure that we have the right clothing on and that right clothing only comes through the blood of the Lamb. And so, no doubt, this huge multitude heard the gospel and by hearing the gospel, they were saved. And we're told here that they were martyred because they probably would not take the mark of the beast, therefore their lives were taken from them which gives us a clue as to what life will be like on the earth during that period of time. Because we're told in Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, that everyone who does not take the mark of the beast will be beheaded. And so, no doubt, these individuals sacrificed their lives because they believed the gospel, they believed the truth. And to me, that's a very sobering thought. And I ask myself, if the situation ever got to the point where I was facing life and death, what choice would I make? Would I listen to the world and the enticement, fearing for my own life, and make the wrong choice? Or would I believe the Word of God and the promises that God has given to us? And here we see a glimpse of those promises, do we not? As God now rewards these faithful witnesses who stood for Him, and as a result, are receiving their reward. So, chapter 7, we see two scenes. The 144,000 Jewish witnesses who go throughout the world proclaiming the gospel. The second scene, this huge number in heaven that could not be numbered. They were martyred, no doubt, and so thus they're in heaven now ready to receive the reward. They have the right clothing on. Now, as we come now to chapter 8, we read that Jesus is opening now the seventh seal. Recall that the seventh seal does not have a specific judgment, but it ushers in seven trumpet judgments. So, Seal number seven does not initiate a judgment per se, but it initiates a series of judgments called the trumpet judgments, which will follow here in chapter eight. So as we turn to chapter eight, we read here in verses one and two, when he, Jesus, opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now briefly, we saw these individuals back in chapter 7, along with the four angels who were restraining the winds. But here in chapter 8 now, we see a full glimpse of these seven, seven angels. So, here they are. Now, before these seven angels can sound their trumpets, or at least begin the series of judgments, we are told that after Jesus opens that seventh seal, which we saw, there is silence in heaven for a half an hour. No doubt this silence is a very ominous silence because it's pointing to the tremendous destructive force that's about to take place upon this planet. So therefore we're told that these seven angels stand before God and they're waiting. What are they waiting for? They're waiting for God's command to start. And so that's where we find them. Now let's just get a preview of what these seven angels will do and their judgments. The first one, in verse 7 of chapter 8, as their trumpet sounds, the green grass and one-third of the trees are burned up. The second trumpet, one-third of the sea becomes blood and one-third of the ships are destroyed, verses 8 and 9 of chapter 8. Third trumpet sounds, and one-third of the waters become bitter, undrinkable, 
in verse 10 of chapter 8. The fourth trumpet, one third of the sun, moon, and stars do not shine, verse 12. Trumpet number five, there's an invasion of locusts. And as a result, they wield this huge army that take over the earth. Sixth trumpet, there's a 200 million man army. And as a result of this army and the locusts and all the other plagues, one third of mankind is killed. Now keep in mind, back in chapter six, because of the judgments there, one fourth of the world's population was killed. Here, one third of that remaining portion is also killed. So when you add the two numbers together, one third and one quarter, you end up with one half. So by the time you get through these trumpet judgments here in chapter nine, one half of the world's population has been wiped out. Well, what is it? We're approaching what, eight billion people, I think right now, so do the math. Four billion, right? That would be a major catastrophe. Then the seventh, the kingdom of God is declared. Like the seal judgments, the seventh judgment also does not initiate a particular judgment, but it will introduce another series of seven judgments, which we'll see later on. But going back to the trumpet judgments, we see, first of all, there's a prelude to the beginning of these judgments. We read here in chapter eight, verses two and three, I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should alter, offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. So this prelude that's taking place before the first trumpet judgment is announced. So we're told that there was a period of silence that went for a half an hour before these judgments begin. Some have jokingly said that, no, this is proof that there's no women in heaven because we got a half an hour of silence here, right? <laughs> but this prelude, we hear, read about the prayers of the saints. When we pray, we can be assured that God keeps track of them all. As he keeps track of our tears in a bottle, so does he keep track of our prayers. I'm reminded of my mother-in-law who's been with the Lord now for several years. She was a tremendous prayer warrior. She would spend every morning in prayer, praying for her family and all. The interesting thing of it is, after the Lord has taken her home, we're still seeing her prayers being answered with family members getting saved and people outside of the family getting saved. And so none of those prayers are wasted. And so here we have in verses three through five, the evidence of those prayers, because we're told in verse three, then another angel having a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense, which the prayers of the saints, <clears throat> with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer. He filled it with fire from the altar and he threw it upon the earth and there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So, we see that there's another angel that comes forth here in verse three, which when we see, see something like that, we wonder, okay, where, where's this angel coming from? Who is he? Well, there's some that say, um, well, this angel maybe is just Jesus. He comes forth to initiate now all this is taking place. No, Jesus has been opening up the seals, right? Because going back to verse one, we're told that Jesus opened the seven seals. So it cannot be Jesus. It's just another angel, perhaps one of the seven angels, which we've already looked at. But we notice here the incense that is offered. You remember how I talked about how the, the book of Revelation so often repeatedly references Old Testament truth over and over again. Some have estimated over 400 occurrences in the book of Revelation reference Old Testament truth. 
things that God has already done or said. And this is one of those instances, because we know the instance that is off, the instance that is offered here in verses three and four. Going back in the Old Testament, when God instructed Moses to construct the tabernacle, he didn't just come up with his own idea on how that should be. Hebrews chapter eight, verse five tells us that Moses was instructed and given a pattern to follow. Because we're told in Hebrews 8, 5, Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle where he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown to you on the mountain, that is Mount Sinai. So Moses was given a blueprint, so to speak. He knew exactly how this tabernacle should be. And so therefore it was instructed accordingly. So we see now the incense that was offered and we know as that tabernacle was made complete, it had many altars. And one of the altars was that altar of incense, which was in the holy place. And so we're told here in Revelation chapter 15, verse five, where John writes, after these things, I looked and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. So here we have a reference to the heavenly tabernacle. So therefore, we know that what Moses constructed with the people was patterned after the heavenly tabernacle. So what we see is we read through the Old Testament books, especially the Pentateuch, and we see that tabernacle being described and the priests that work in it. That is a reflection of the heavenly tabernacle that's been there throughout all of eternity. And so that altar of incense was not just something that Moses came up with because he had a good idea. No, it was patterned after that heavenly altar of incense. And we see now the incense that was offered. As a result of this incense that was offered and raises up, we know that this represents the prayers of the saints. God loves when we pray. Oh, we should pray more. Because God honors those prayers. To him, it's like a sweet smelling savor when it comes from the heart. And so we should be praying more and more all the time because God takes pleasure in it. And we see here the tremendous impact that those prayers had. Look with me in verses five and six. Then the angel, this angel that we saw earlier, took the censer, he filled it with fire from the altar and he threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. So now finally, this incense mixed with fire is thrown to the earth. God will now begin to answer the prayers of the saints which have been going up like incense through the ages. Recall back in chapter six about those who were martyred and said, oh Lord, how long until you avenge us of our blood of those who dwell upon the earth? That was a prayer. And so God is now honoring that prayer plus many others. Recall back in chapter five, when no one was found to take the seal and loose its seals, John wept because he could not foresee, you know, life indefinitely going on without some measure that God would bring about to bring it to an end. So therefore, this incense represents the saints throughout all the ages. Think about all of those who have been martyred through the ages and there's so many being martyred today. And God will be moved by those tremendous steps of faith on those who offer their lives up before the Lord. And so we see now this angel with this golden censer Going back to the Old Testament, God commanded through Moses that the priest, Aaron, and those who came after him, they were to go into the holy place every morning and every night and put fresh incense upon that altar of incense. Now a priest would represent the people before God. And so figuratively speaking, as they went in and attend to the needs of that altar morning and night, symbolically, they were offering the prayers of the people up to God. That's what a priest does. Well, you and I have been made priests, right? 
According to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, God has made us a royal priesthood. Therefore, our function, our job, is to represent people before God. And that's why prayer is so vitally important. So, we see the impact that these prayers make. And what happens? Well, there's noises, thunderings, lightnings, and even an earthquake. We saw an earthquake back in chapter 6, so here we have another earthquake. So finally, the prayers of the saints are being answered. I think about that verse in Luke chapter 18, verse 7, where Jesus talked about the importance of being faithful all the way through, regardless of time, and offering our prayers, knowing that one day God will avenge his elect. And so Jesus said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith upon the earth? Which kind of tells us that the end of days, people will be struggling with their faith and believing God because they've had to wait so long. And they figured, well, you know, there's no point in keep praying because God's not going to do anything. But the point Jesus wanted to get across is, it's not a matter of time. It's a matter of faithfulness. So God bears up with us, certainly so. As we come to verse 7, we find these, the first of these seven angels, and he sounds his trumpet. So let's now get an overview of these trumpet judgments. We know that when they begin to sound, it will be a terrible calamity that would be poured out upon this earth, things that we can't begin to imagine. Here in chapter 8, we have the four trumpet judgments, and we call them the four terrible trumpets. And what kind of punishment accompanies these trumpet judgments? Well, the first trumpet judgment sounds. What happens, as we saw in our overview, one-third of the trees and the grass is burned up. Well, that's what animal food supply, right? So one-third of the trees are burned up. And this is very much like the seventh plague that took place back in the book of Exodus concerning the judgments that were poured out upon Egypt. Exodus chapter 9, verses 22 through 26 talks about this and gives a very similar construction. Again, we see something that God has already done in the past as we look at these trumpet judgments. So all of the green grass is burned up, which affects the food supply for animals and to some degree, food supply for man. Then the second judgment ensues. This time, it affects the sea life, the ships are destroyed and so forth like that. Well, if you've ever gone down to the LA port or Long Beach and seeing all the ships coming in, you realize how much our livelihood depends upon sea traffic, right? Now, what would happen if one third of those ships are destroyed? How much do we depend upon products coming in from the Far East and other places, you know? Or even products that we are now shipping out to other places, which is now giving a basis for a growing economy. But one third of all those ships are destroyed. And uh, so no doubt it will be a great devastation. So one third of the sea life becomes blood. Again, paralleling one of the judgments there in the book of Exodus, that first plague where the river Nile was turned into blood. Imagine going down to the ocean. Let's take a day and go down to the beach. You get down there, it's all blood. That'd be a shocker, would it not? And so this is the kind of a judgment that's coming. And we're told, how does this come about? Well, as we go back to chapter 8, we read here. Then, <clears throat> let's see. So, verse 6. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood and they were thrown into the earth, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all of the green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounds his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. Now, some huge particle, like a meteor or something like that, is thrown into the sea. And that in itself brings about this judgment where the ships are destroyed, the ocean becomes, becomes like blood, and a third of the living creatures uh, of the sea died. How much of the world 
lives off of the food that comes out of the ocean. Tremendous amounts, do we not? So I'm thinking that you won't be having any more lobster, at least the people in that day. They won't be enjoying lobster anymore. No more lobster dinners. So one third of the sea becomes blood. One third of the sea life is killed. One third of the ships are destroyed. Now we come to the third trumpet judgment. Notice verse 10. Then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch and it fell <clears throat> on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. So this time now, this mediator, whatever, some heavenly body falls to the earth and pretty much destroys the fresh water. Well, how long can you go without a drink of water or something to drink? You know, the greatest bodily need is being able to breathe, right? The second greatest bodily need is thirst, having something to drink. The third is food. So being able to drink is very, very important, but now the fresh water supply is being affected. And so you can imagine the tremendous calamity that's facing the world's population at this particular time as a result of this third trumpet judgment. The rivers and springs are made bitter. You can't drink it. The fourth judgment now ensues because we read here in verse 12, then the fourth angel sounded and a third of the sun was struck and a third of the moon and a third of the stars so that the third of them were darkened and a third of the day did not shine and likewise the night. So here we have in this fourth judgment, a plague somewhat, you might call it that, that is very similar to the ninth plague that took place in Egypt, that plague of darkness, which we can't imagine what it would be like in not being able to see. Flashlights won't work, candles won't work. You're in absolute darkness. I don't, you probably have had some of these experiences where you go into like an underground cavern, you know, and the tour guide takes you through, you know, and it's just amazing all the sights you see. And he says, let's do an experiment here. Let's turn out all the lights. So he turns it all out. So it's absolutely dark. You can't see the end of your nose on your face, right? And maybe he'll have a match that he'll light. And suddenly, oh my goodness, you see all kinds of things just from a match. But imagine what it was like, what it's going to be like to live on this planet where you can't see a thing, completely dark. I think that is so symbolic of that place that God calls outer darkness. No doubt a petrifying, terrible place. And so here we have this final plague. Well, Jesus, you know, he announced that these kinds of things would happen. There in Luke chapter 21, verse 25, he talked about these heavenly disasters, calamities that will take place. Verse 13 tells us, then one of, <clears throat> uh, sorry, verse 13 says, um, and I looked and I heard another angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet <clears throat> of the three angels who, who are about to sound. So here we have this final warning for these trumpet judgments. So this final angel comes forth and what does he do? He announces these woes. Now, we will see as we get into chapter 9, there are these three woes that follow all the way into chapter 12. And because the word woe is mentioned, it tells us that these next judgment are the most serious of all so far. And so God, through this angel, is announcing a woe upon the earth because of the tremendous devastation that will take place. And so this, these judgments are all enumerated by the three woes. So as we get into chapter 9 next week and move all the way into chapter 12, you'll see those three woes, what's accompany those judgments. So this final woe, the third woe, will be the seventh trumpet judgment. Now, like the seventh seal judgment, the seventh trumpet judgment will not be a judgment per se, but it will initiate the seven bowl judgments, which are the most serious and devastating judgments of all. And that's why it will truly be the greatest woe of all. These judgments will fall upon the inhabitants of the earth, those who do not have the seal of God upon their foreheads, as we'll see in chapter nine. But in this judgment, again, the sun, moon, and stars are darkened. And Jesus said there in Luke 21, verse 25, 
talking about this day, this coming day, there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on the earth, and there will be a distress of the nations with perplexity, and the sea and the waves will be roaring. So therefore, we see now these three woes that are coming. Aren't you thankful that you won't be witnessing these things? My mind was just kind of exploding today, thinking through all the scriptures that talk about the rapture in one sense or another. And I find that God has made it so clear and so sure to know that the church of Jesus Christ will be saved from this seven year period of time, will be in heaven. And that should make us so happy and so glad and so thankful, right? That we won't see any of these things. So therefore, why did God give us this information if we're not going to be here to witness these things? Any thoughts? To share with others. What's that? To share with others. Yes. Yes. And what else? Doesn't it stir you to want to live a righteous, holy, sober life? So you will be counted worthy? Remember there in Luke 21, Jesus said, Pray always that you might be counted worthy to escape these things that will occur upon the earth. It should make us a praying people, right? It should prompt us to live holy, sober lives before the Lord. Because this is going to happen. It will happen. You have family members that aren't saved? Well, the rapture takes place tomorrow. Where will they be? They'll be caught in all of this. And so it should give us a tremendous burden for people to want to go out and witness. I find that because God has given us this book and it's become so current today that our witnessing Using the truth of this book is so very easy. It's like handwriting on the wall. Look at the world events. Look what is happening and so forth like that. The Bible's been foretelling these events would take place for centuries. Are you ready? It's all coming together. There's no question about it. It's all going to happen. So we know that's all going to take place. Okay. Come on, baby, stop.